So good morning everyone and good afternoon to those who are joining us from other parts of the world and maybe good evening. I, I'm not sure where uh, all the audience is from, but hello everyone to this uh, and welcome to this particular uh, book talk which we have organized uh, uh, and uh, I was just having this conversation with Matt McDonald and he was saying this is his first book talk. So we are very happy to host uh, uh, the first talk on this particular book for him and he has many other events lined up as well in the uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, so before I actually uh, uh, you know, start the proceedings. I'm. I'll. I would like to invite Dr. Nan Kishore, who's the head of the department uh, and associate professor at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, to give the welcome remarks. Um, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My <clears throat> special thanks to Dr. Matt McDonald for uh, having accepted our uh, invitation to be part of this particular lecture. We are indeed honored to have you here and uh, we're also glad that this is the first book discussion uh, that's happening uh, and I think it's on a pertinent issue. So less researched, uh, at least I can say in international relations where at least to uh, with reference to my department, except for a section that Dr. Dhanushri leads with, we largely deal with um, hardcore security issues and then uh, environmental security, uh, climate change, all these have come very, uh, very late to our, our scenarios. But at the same time, um, as I mentioned, where security has has come up in a big way. I think it's it's picking up, uh, and also I think a lot of researcher uh, researchers across across the spectrum I think are trying to look at and then connect some of the. IR theories and many other things that they're trying to do with uh, though there are very uh, different type of difficulties that are associated with some of the uh, classical theories, but yet they are trying to cope up with uh, the requirements, especially coming from sustainable development uh, perspective where human productivity and life is also a major concern. Looking at the ideas of resilience, adapting to conditions and the changes that are coming in the environment where some sort of ecological, ecological da damage that's uh, constantly happening and people have started accepting at least those uh, important components. Uh, and I think Department of Geopolitics and International is, uh, Relations uh, at Manipal is also trying to emphasize a lot more on these aspects. And now we are also trying to look at how theoretically and as well as practically uh, use some of the traditionally available concepts and then also look at innovatively linking some of these aspects into the type of problem that India is going through. I think we are also equally concerned with the type of issues that India is going through and, and this being such a vast country. Consensus building is not an easy uh, issue. Domestically, it's very difficult. There's a lot more education that's required. Constantly, we need to make progress. Constantly, we need to educate. Then only they'll get an idea of it because they're used to a particular type of discourse. And from there to break the wall and then enter into these new arenas is not an easy task. I think in, in that perspective, uh, linking the younger generation and also taking some of these aspects to the next generation of uh, international relations scholars, I think your talk will go a long way. I'm extremely happy to have you here and I congratulate my colleague, Dr. Dhanushri, for ta having taken this initiative to have you with us and we look forward to many more lectures, many more interactions with you even in our classes and and uh, uh, let's see how we can collaborate as institutions and, and take this forward. Thank you so much for being here and uh, over to you Dr. Dhanushree. Thank you so much Dr. Nankishore. Uh, so as as he mentioned, this book talk will, I mean of course it's going to lay the foundations for various things. Uh, it is a book discussion uh, on uh, uh, Professor Matt McDonald's book on ecological security, climate change and the construction of security. So of course this book is not just about climate change and ecological security, but it's, it's also a, a discourse that is going to tell us more about security as such. Tell us why security needs to be looked at from different perspectives uh, and which is something very important for an audience uh, in India because we, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Nankishore also mentioned, uh, we don't have that many discourses on critical security in India. 
So it's very important that we also kind of reflect on these discourses, which will help us address these concerns in a much better way, not just theoretically, but also practically. Uh, so uh, as as uh, uh, as uh, uh, as Dr. Nandkishore mentioned, uh, uh, we uh, uh, we are very happy to have Professor Matt McDonald uh, in this uh, in this morning hours in India. Uh, but also, I see that there are a lot of guests uh, who, who have joined from outside India as well. So I would like to welcome them once again. Uh, so the book essentially, uh, just to give you a brief background to the book, I'm not going too much into it, considering that uh, you know anyway, uh, Matt is going to talk about it. Uh, but it's essentially about climate change um, and the construction of climate change as a security issue and the ethical issues concerned with how do you really construct climate change as a security issue. And very importantly, we normally use national security, human security, non-traditional security, traditional security, all these different typologies to link climate change with security. Uh, however, uh, what uh, this book tries to tell us is that there are other perspectives and insights which we can draw from uh, political ecology, feminism, cl critical theory and all these different disciplines to also understand how we can move towards a discourse on ecological security to look at the resilience of ecosystems itself. And that is a very important part of uh, how we look at climate change in the future because what we are seeing today is a crisis situation. It's no longer about the future. It's no longer about the future generations. It is about today and we are already seeing signs of how climate change can disrupt security in so many different ways. Um, so just to give you also a short bio of uh, Professor Matt McDonald, he's an associate professor uh, and reader in the International Relations in the School of Public uh, Political Science and International Studies, University of Queensland. He's the author of several books, so this is uh, this is one among several books that he's talking about. Uh, he's the author of Security, The Environment and Emancipation, published in 2012. He's a co-author with uh, Anthony Burke and uh, Katrina Liku of Ethics and Global Security, which is also one of the books that I have read and you know learned a lot. And in fact, I, I should also say that my PhD has benefited a lot from your works. I mean, I literally lived on some of the books that you and uh, Anthony Burke and some of the others, you know, uh, have produced, especially in the critical security study. So very glad that, you know, I'm able to finally be able to meet you virtually and uh, talk about these things uh, uh, in person as well. Uh, and he's also, as as uh, as I already mentioned, the author of Ecological Security. So he's currently working on a, an ARC funded project examining comparative national responses to security implications of climate change. So uh, this is a topic that most of our students are interested in. They have heard about it. However, as, as I mentioned, these are the kind of discourses that are not well developed in the Indian context. So like, you know, I would I would uh, I would expect you to sort of also reflect on why we need this kind of discourse in a in a in a much deeper way. And that can actually take us a long way from here, not just academically, but also, as I mentioned, practically. All right. So thank you so much once again. And uh, uh, I, I'll the the screen is yours now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. What a lovely introduction. I really do appreciate that. I worry that uh, Nanda and, and Dhanasri have set the bar uh, too high for me with such a lovely, um, such a lovely introduction. Hopefully you can see my um, screen and the uh, uh, slides that I have up over there now. Um, so as Dhanasri has noted, this is a uh, presentation on a book that's coming out in just a couple of weeks time. Um, that looks at ecological security um, and attempts to make a case for why we should view security when thinking about climate change through the lens of uh, ecosystem resilience as a means of addressing the rights and needs of the most vulnerable across time, uh, across space and across species. So I'll hopefully give a little bit of content to those things over the course of the next uh, 25 minutes. Um, so essentially this uh, project looks at, uh, starts from the recognition that climate change is increasingly recognised and viewed 
as a security issue. Um, this is getting harder and harder to uh, to contest, really, that when we think of an issue like climate change, we do recognise that this constitutes a threat to security. We see this, of course, in increasing debates uh, in the UN Security Council, debates first in 2007, then again in 2011, but we've seen debates each year in 2000 and since 2018 with another um, a second debate of 2021 to come in just a few weeks time. We've seen the establishment of a climate security um, mechanism. So that uh, essentially is uh, within the UN system, uh, recognition again of the international security implications of, of climate change at the highest level. We've seen ARIA formula debates, which are informal debates within the UN Security Council. We've seen high profile discussions about the role of climate change in contributing to conflicts in places like Darfur uh, in Sudan um, and South Sudan and in even in Syria. And while there's lots of contestation over exactly what this means and exactly what the role of climate change has been in those contexts, it does point to this overwhelming sense that it's getting harder to contest the idea that climate change constitutes a uh, security issue. Indeed, Shirley Scott, um, some a few years ago now, published a paper in which she said that um, of states that are producing national security strategy documents, more than 70% of those increasingly recognise the um, particular security implications of climate change. So it's an issue that has become more and more prominent over time. Um, we've seen lots of attention to, other than those policy debates, we've seen lots of attention to in academic circles um, around both the analytical questions of how we relate climate change and security and crucially normative questions over whether that linkage is a good thing and something to be pursued. So on the former, on analytical grounds, we might see questions like how exactly does climate change contribute to instability or indeed conflict? Um, with lots of uh, analysts talking about ideas like climate change serving as a threat multiplier that makes conflict more likely. Um, does it warrant being considered a security issue and how does it change in important ways the way we think about the role of traditional security agencies like defence and the military, for example, in that context? So those are some of the bigger analytical questions in this space. How do we make sense of that connection between climate change and security? But a lot of these questions are driven by normative concerns as well, or ethical questions. Is securitization a good thing? Um, does it help mobilize uh, or does it speak to different audiences? So some arguments suggest that actually if you present something as a security issue, it's more likely to get attention and to get the type of priority that's consistent with addressing the problem. At the heart of this is recognition that, of course, the promise of providing security is the fundamental basis for the legitimacy of nation states themselves. So this promise that we are here to provide security is actually what the social contract is based on, this idea that states exist and derive their legitimacy for providing for the well-being uh, of others, of their citizens. In that context, of course, it really matters whether we view something as a security issue or not. It's seen as mobilising, as creating um, conditions in which states are more likely and other powerful actors like the UN are more likely to recognise their obligations in that context and actually commit to addressing uh, the problem itself. So. For some, that language of security can really help mobilise. It can give this sense of urgency, of priority, of, of attention. It can also potentially speak to some audiences who might be unmoved by claims about the rights and needs of future generations, for example, but are deeply concerned about the possibility of um, climate refugees coming over the border or deeply concerned about the territorial integrity of, of the state itself. For others though, um, this linkage between climate change and security is best avoided because it could help encourage illiberal responses to the problem. It could encourage militaries to take on a more central role than is appropriate for addressing something like uh, an environmental challenge. It could encourage exceptional responses in times where you actually need 
deliberation where you need lots of engagement with society through democratic processes to help um, address some of these issues. And as I know dentistry would know, one really fascinating thing in, the, in a recent UN Security Council debate was that the uh, Indian delegation actually invoked um, securitization as a concern when pointing to um, climate change being discussed in the Security Council saying, are we worried about encouraging the wrong types of responses to this particular issue? So those latter questions, those normative questions, are questions around, is it appropriate? Is it a good thing to consider climate change as a security issue? This book, so much of this book is based on the idea that that isn't the right question to be asking. Um, if we're interested in the ethical implications of tying climate change and security, what matters isn't whether climate change is viewed as a security issue or not, but how security is defined and understood. So in the book itself, I distinguish between what I call discourses of climate security, all of which have different choices of referent object or the answer to the question of whose security is worth preserving. And these point in turn to different sets of responses to the problem of, of climate change itself. And that's really important. It helps explain my engagement with security because security is, is central to the, the, the political legitimacy of key actors in politics. And it helps define importance. So in that context, my argument is that it's really important to actually engage with and assess the normative or practical implications of different accounts of security. Um, to put it really simply, there are multiple different ways of approaching this relationship um, between climate change on the one hand and security on the other. And it makes sense for us to pull back and ask whose security at a fundamental level are we talking about when we make these connections? And what are the different types of practices that are encouraged when our answer to that question is nation states versus the international community versus human security, uh, for example. So in earlier work, um, and this is in some ways the, the foundation for this particular book, um, in earlier work I made these distinctions between different discourses of climate security and developed this uh, kind of typology or this table uh, that you see there. Um, this was published in the journal Political Geography in 2013. And the ar argument here or the idea here was to say, look, there are lots of different ways of approaching this problem. And that's important to recognise because these different approaches have different implications. What I've realised in the process of preparing and writing that approach is that actually I was working on the assumption that these different discourses, some of them, to put it really bluntly and really simply, some of them are better than others in terms of the practices that they encourage and in terms of the extent to which they focus our attention on addressing the problem of climate change directly. Um, and in that context, the challenge for me was then to say, well, if I think that some of these discourses are better than others, then it becomes important for me not just to map different accounts of security, but actually to make a case for a particular um, discourse, to make a case for why it's important to view climate change and its relationship to security through this particular lens, talk about what it means in practice, what sort of choices that would encourage around the responses to climate change, and then crucially also engage with this question, how we might actually get there. And in the end, those distinctions are central to the structure of the, the book itself. So some discourses, to put it bluntly, are better than others in terms of the extent to which they are ethically defensible in focusing on the rights and needs of the most vulnerable. And in terms of prioritising responses that address the problem itself. So the national security focus that you see at the top there is a focus that, that defines the security implications of climate change in indirect terms and essentially doesn't view climate change in and of itself for the most part as a security threat. Rather, what it does is essentially say, climate change becomes a security issue to the extent that it challenges the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the state 
and the capacity for the state to actually function to provide more traditionally defined security in terms of um, military capacity. Uh, there may be exceptions, there may be situations in which climate change is recognised as a direct threat to security here if you're talking about states that um, could be wholly inundated, for example, with rising sea levels. But for the most part, climate change is represented as a kind of indirect or secondary threat to national security. This focus on national security then, because it's not emphasising the direct threat posed by climate change, but rather the ways in which climate change might have flow on effects for things like stability or conflict or population movement or the viability of military infrastructure, for example. Um, because it has that focus, it tends to then encourage responses focused on adaptation rather than mitigation. So rather than address the problem at its core, we try to insulate ourselves, protect ourselves from the effects of climate change. This was really most famously captured in a 2003 Pentagon uh, report on an abrupt on the national security implications for the United States of an abrupt climate change scenario um, in which the authors made the case that relatively protected or um, wealthy states, well endowed states like the United States, might ultimately um, be challenged by population displacement from other countries uh, as a result of natural disasters or rising sea levels, they might in turn seek to build more effective border controls to stop those climate refugees, those displaced people from actually reaching the Australian mainland, from the American mainland. This is, I think, a perverse response to the security implications of climate change in which not only are we not addressing the problem at its core, but we're actually presenting those who are most directly threatened by climate change, those who are displaced, as threats to our national security. And that's, I think, as I would say, a perverse response to the implications of climate change, but one ultimately relatively consistent with this national security framing. In 2019, the UN um, Human Rights Rapporteur made the case that we could potentially see a climate apartheid in which relatively wealthy states increasingly try to insulate themselves from the effects of climate change, focusing on adaptation and leaving the most vulnerable parts of the world, um, parts usually populated by um, people from developing countries, leave them to feel the brunt of climate change itself. So I see lots of potential problems with that national security framing. Now, one potential correction to that is to, to then focus on international security and the idea of climate change as a transnational problem by saying, to what extent can we recognise climate change as a security issue at the level of its challenge or threat to the international community as a whole? And in this context, um, we might say that a threat to international stability um, is increasingly recognised as a, as a challenge to um, security itself. With this particular framework where the focus is on international security, and we see this through the UN Security Council discussions, for example, um, we're largely talking about situations, again, where climate change poses a secondary risk in terms of its effect on population displacement, on um, people's in turn coming into uh, contact and conflict potentially with each other. So here, the danger, the, the normative danger is less um, clear than, less immediately apparent than with a focus that just says, let's protect the nation state in the face of what is immediately recognisable as a global threat. But nonetheless, it's still focused on how do we preserve the state system as it's currently constituted from the threat of climate change itself. So in this context, arguably, an international security approach encourages a focus on the preservation of a status quo, a status quo that for many has in part driven the problem of climate change in and of itself. So that discourse is more defensible in some ways than national security, but still has its own problems um, and still does tend towards a focus on um, adaptation and viewing climate change as a secondary threat. 
We don't see the same challenge when it comes to human security and recognition that actually we should focus on the ways in which climate change poses a threat to human welfare and human populations directly. This is, in this sense, a, a recognition that climate change can pose a direct security threat to humans, human populations. So that's an important corrective. Um, and focuses on the the most vu on vulnerability here in terms of people, in particular in developing countries who might be disproportionately affected by um, climate change itself. But even here, when we focus on human welfare and human security, yes, there's far more of a focus on mitigation as a response to climate change. There's some recognition of the universality of the problem in the sense we are focusing on human collectives. Um, but even here, this doesn't take us far enough in terms of recognition of rights of future generations of human beings. Um, and it doesn't take us far enough in terms of recognising obligations to other living beings um, beyond humans themselves. So this is helpful and progressive from that international security context, but it still doesn't take us to the question of future generations or other living beings who are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. They're least responsible for the problem itself, of course, um, most directly affected um, by climate change and, and their lives and life prospects are so fundamentally compromised um, by it. But of course, also when we're talking about future generations or other living beings, they're least able to influence the nature of our response to the problem itself. So that's the foundation in some ways for a recognition that there are these limits to existing accounts of climate security that focus on human collectives and human institutions that take us to a certain point but don't recognise the importance of going further. And I want to make a case that actually what constitutes a progressive approach to um, climate security, to this relationship between climate security, is a focus on ecological security. And the book ultimately, after making this sort of foundational claim about how I view security as a process of social construction, within particular political communities that decide how it is they view their values that are in need of being protected or advanced and based on the idea that we see these different accounts or discourses of security that are competing to in some ways to to characterize the way in which actors like states ultimately view um, security so after that foundation and then walking the reader through here are these different discourses of climate security and why they don't take us as far as they should in terms of recognising and fundamentally addressing the nature of the threat. The book then goes on to go deep on the question of what ecological security is. So what it is, why it's necessary, what it means in practice, and crucially, in some ways, the more challenging question, how we might actually get there. This is in some ways the big question how do we get to a point if there are enough challenges associated with something like human security for example how do we get to the point where political communities view security in the context of climate change through the lens of the rights and needs of uh, future generations and other living beings and ecological resilient ecosystem resilience so first of all what is ecological security the book makes a case that ecological security should be understood in terms of the resilience of ecosystems themselves, their capacity to continue to function in the face of change in this context, climate change. With it, my argument is that if we focus on that, on ecosystem resilience, we in turn orient our concern to the rights and needs of the most vulnerable. Yes, across space in terms of obligations to peoples in the developing world to the most vulnerable, impoverished populations throughout the world, for example, but also in terms of time, the most vulnerable over time um, being, of course, future generations and the most vulnerable um, in terms of species, so other living beings. So the argument here is that if we focus on ecosystem resilience, if that's the lens through which we view this issue, the relationship between climate change and security, we're likely to focus in turn on the rights and needs of the most vulnerable across time, across space and across species. 
So why is this necessary other than the limits of the discourses that I've mentioned before in terms of not necessarily taking us as far as we would like to go in the case of human security or more directly having genuinely problematic responses to climate change on the other. One of the other important contexts here is the context of the so-called Anthropocene. So the argument that we are now in a geological era defined by humanity's impact on Earth's systems and their functionality. In this context, my, my argument would be that we need to move beyond all those other discourses because they all stop short of recognising the um, placement, if you like, of humanity in a broader ecosystem context. They all tend to close off either um, human collectives or human institutions from the ecological conditions of our own existence. So we need, in the context of the Anthropocene, it becomes really difficult to sustain this separation between humanity and nature that seems to characterise so much of modern political thought, action. And we need to recognise the uh, role of interrelationships um, between humanity and nature, for example, the impossibility as well of closing humanity off from the conditions of its own existence. So in the book and in this context, it, I draw on second generation ecological pluralist thought, the work of people like uh, Robin Eckersley, that tries to break down this distinction between anthropocentrism and ecocentrism as a fairly unhelpful distinction, especially in the Anthropocene context. I also draw on feminist thought in making the case for interrelationships and multiple axes of uh, discrimination of marginalisation as being central to what we're trying to address. Um, this is, of course, acutely challenging um, given the complexity of prioritising responses and the scale of uncertainty and complexity when it comes to how ecosystems actually function. These things make it really, really challenging to say in um, very direct terms, this is what ecological security means or would encourage. And it's actually for that reason that in the book, I make a case for approaching ecological security as a kind of sensibility, as a as an inclination in terms of the ways in which we understand that connection between climate change and security, rather than as a set of rules or an institutional arrangement um, necessary in, in some ways to make this to make this happen. My argument is if we approach these things in particular ways, the institutional arrangements that will facilitate that will um, make them will develop uh, or more organically. So the book, as noted, goes into this, this uh, outlines this question. First, when I go through the contours of ecological security, first says, well, um, you know, who is the reference object of security? In this case, it's ecosystems multiple, they're multiple, they're interconnecting, they're not easy referent objects in the sense that some ecosystems can be very, very small and others very, very large, and they overlap, of course, with each other. So we're not talking about individual, you know, one of 200 states in the international system, we're talking about lots of um, different uh, scales of, um, of ecosystems in this in this context. So I talk first about, you know, who the referent object is in this framework and why this way, what what in some ways, what some of the ethical foundations of that um, are. Uh, before then going through questions of what does it mean in practice in terms of the means and agents of security? So in other work, I've made the case that security is a sort of site of contestation in which we see different discourses of security defined in terms of their choice of what the nature of the threat is, the reference object of security whose security is under threat, um, means of security, agents of security as well. So on means and the appropriate response to um, climate change, I say here that we need to move beyond uh, that, certainly move beyond that um, tendency to focus on the adaptation that we see in a national security framing. Um, but in making sense of, of course, mitigation becomes central because ecosystems, some ecosystems will be seriously affected. So if we think about coral, um, coral reefs, for example, some will be seriously affected by even a one degree um, temperature rise, which is looking, which we've already passed. Um, in that sense, mitigation and urgent mitigation is the central means of response 
to um, this particular, uh, to the security challenges if we're viewing it through an ecological security lens. But there is still a role for adaptation of both human societies and ecosystems to try to minimise the harm um, that could befall people as a, and ecosystems and um, other living beings as a result of, of climate change. Even, and this was a particularly challenging discussion, something I've been working on as well since, there may even be a role for some forms of technological intervention that we might describe as geoengineering, whether um, carbon dioxide removal or solar radiation management as forms of response to the climate crisis, largely to buy us time in terms of managing that rapid transition away from um, greenhouse gas, from fossil fuels. Um, but and minimising harm associated with the effects of climate change itself. Um, on Also on means, I make a case in the book that this isn't enough to basically say this is, it's enough to focus on mitigation, adaptation, even potentially some role for geoengineering. I make a case for the centrality of dialogue, humility and reflexivity in terms of what all these things mean in practice. So in terms of dialogue, we need to ensure that there is constant conversation about the appropriateness of particular forms of response, that we draw on local knowledges, indigenous knowledges, for example, about how ecosystems function, that we ensure that means of response are sustainable over time by actually engaging local communities in um, building support for those things. We need humility in the sense that we need to be acutely aware that there are significant and inherent limits to our own understanding of what effects particular interventions will have on ecosystems. This is not least in the context, despite all the scientific work about climate change, we still can't say with absolute certainty whether there will be climate tipping points, at which point particular ecosystems are going to be fundamentally and irrevocably compromised, when we'll see tip over into um, other sets of implications. We all know that despite knowing that natural disasters are going to become more frequent and more intense in the context of climate change, we also know in that context that we can't necessarily tie particular sets of bushfires or um, floods or cyclones directly to climate change. We know that they'll they'll make it complicated and um, that they'll make them more likely, but not necessarily cause them um, in that in that sense. And all those things suggest the need for us to be humble about what we can claim, um, rather than have this sense of hubris around how we approach the effects of climate change and respond to it. Related to that is this uh, importance of reflexivity, of stepping back as we're engaging in practices aimed at enhancing ecological security to say, are our initial policy settings and practical responses right? Are there things we need to do to change? How is it that our initial assumptions are bearing out in terms of some of the um, implications of those things in practice? And then, um, in terms of agents, I define this primarily in terms of agency for me is multivariate, is really significant in terms of multiple different sets of agents in the international system. It's primarily defined in terms of capacity, um, drawing on notions of distributive justice in this sense. So I say here, there is clearly a role for states and thinking about what states can do to respond to the challenge of climate change but also a role for individuals, for intergovernmental organisations, for multinational corporations and the nature of their obligation, the nature of their actions depends somewhat on their um, capacity and the nature of their, their nature of their particular obligations also depend on their capacity to bring resource to bear, to consciously address challenges associated with climate change. So lots of different agents involved, and I'm happy to, to draw that out in the context of Q&A. So fi the final chapter of the book deals with this question of how do we actually get there? How do we get from recognition that, yes, this would be a nice way of thinking about the challenges that climate change poses to, to security, to thinking about how do we actually get there in practice? Can we imagine um, that type of image finding purchase and genuinely informing the way communities um, practice 
in response. And here I draw on the work of um, Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist, who makes a case for understanding the possibility of change within structures that seem not particularly conducive for it and how we might think about agency in that context. Here I recognise that there are actually lots of basis for optimism or at least hope in terms of what we might call imminent possibility, possibilities within the existing system. In some ways, core principles that we agree on, like the precautionary principle or common but differentiated responsibility, the development of Oxford principles associated with geoengineering really do draw directly on some of those um, sort of commitments that are seen as part of um, ecological security. There's also um, the prominence attached to the Anthropocene concept is also relevant here. And the ways in which eco ecological movements, uh, environmental movements throughout the world are mobilising, that is in, in some ways ecological security in practice in that context. However, we do need to go further. We need to recognise the need to identify radical alternatives um, to move beyond the existing political system rather than accept it as a given. So rather than my whole argument is that rather than say there are inherent limits to this discourse, so let's develop an alternative approach that will find more purchase among key political institutions. My approach would be to say, if we think this is the most defensible way of approaching this relationship, the imperative shouldn't be to abandon it and try to find something that's more palatable to existing institutions. The imperative instead should be to say, how can we get institutions to recognise and practise in ways that are consistent with this. Um, so that's where we're at in terms of the overall book. The, the contemporary challenge, I think, of climate change requires us to rethink fundamentally the way we think of security, if we are linking climate change and security, and we need to orient towards the resilience of ecosystems themselves. There are, of course, really big challenges and dilemmas in this context associated with how we move beyond our own anthropocentrism, how we deal with uncertainty and complexity around how ecosystems function and will respond to um, external uh, impacts. The politics of how we actually get from recognition that this is progressive to um, practices consistent with it. And the applicability of some of these things beyond climate change as an issue is, is worth considering uh, as well. Those are all big challenges and dilemmas touched on in the book. There are possibly many more that you've identified over the course of the last uh, half an hour or so. Um, I've got the, <laughs> the link to buy the book there. Uh, it comes out in a couple of weeks time. It's almost certainly prohibitively expensive in the first instance, but it really would be an ideal gift for that special someone possibly. Uh, for Christmas, but I will leave my comments there. Thank you so much for that, for that uh, very, I mean, broad at the same time, very specific. Uh, you know, you went into the specifics of the book, each chapter, and I think you've covered a wide range of issues that we need to think about and reflect about. Um, even when we try to, you know, I, as you were talking, I was trying to just apply some of these things in the Indian context uh, and whether it is the politics between the developed and the developing countries or the politics of the vulnerable populations. You talk about the changing landscape that you mentioned, you know, the changing ecosystems itself, all these issues become increasingly important to address security today. And that is not just in terms of, you know, uh, I mean, the various compartmentalization that you do in terms of security, but they are so interconnected with each other at the end of the day, right? So thank you so much for that. Um, I will now uh, open the floor for questions. Please raise your hands. Uh, OK, uh, uh, please raise your hands or you can just post the questions in the chat if that's fine. Um, and uh, OK, so uh, before Okay, let me see if there are any raised hands. Not yet, but okay, I see a message that somebody wants to post a question. Okay, in the meantime, maybe I'll, I'll just start off with a couple of questions that I have. I think one of the issues that you mentioned about the purchase part, right? The purchase of this, uh, the concept of ecological security itself. 
uh, how I mean, you know, uh, there are a lot of works which also talk about the fact that, you know, once you have this ecocentric sort of approach, where do the humans really get uh, placed in that sort of discourse? How do you really make sure that human security discourse or other discourses also find a place in the ecological security discourse? You have already reflected on that a bit. But I was just wondering, like, especially when you take the uh, example of developing countries, uh, right? So who are still looking at a certain development trajectory, uh, even in the coming years, uh, and at the same time looking at severe environmental degradation on account of these developmental activities and otherwise, how do you really, uh, how do you really reflect on these in, you know, inconsistencies that you find, especially when it comes to the developing country context? So yeah, that that's one question. Maybe you can just talk about it. And in the meantime, I'll just collect questions. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Danisrae. That is such an important question, and I think is obviously particularly relevant to uh, this audience today. But um, you know, in the in the case of talking about agency, for example. So there's there's two ways in which I would respond to that. One is that the framework itself is is oriented towards a really radically oriented towards um, vulnerability defined in multiple different ways. But one of those is in terms of marginalisation in the international economic system and levels of poverty and disadvantage. So the most vulnerable currently living humans in the world are really central to this to this discourse. And the way in which that then plays out, so yes, there is this inherent imperative to minimise the harm that will befall them as a result of climate change, as we know they're going to be at the front line, most affected by climate change and least able, most vulnerable, both in the sense of exposure and capacity to respond. You know, we would talk about Bangladesh and the Netherlands, both very low-lying countries, but one with significant resource to deploy seawalls and minimise that challenge of rising sea levels. Um, the other one clearly not. So there is this sense that, of course, we need to orient towards um, moving away from fossil fuels. That's going to be more challenging for some countries than others. But the book actually makes a case when talking about agency in this context that the responsibility for facilitating that change is entirely again determined by capacity, which means in this context, developed states have to reach into their pockets to facilitate that transition away from fossil fuels and to provide alternative energy futures and economic pathways for people in other parts of the world. That is absolutely central to the, to the capabilities framework that I've developed in my conception of agency. So in an immediate sense, the idea of prioritising the environment over the immediate needs of uh, human populations looks challenging in particular in developing states, but actually approaching it in this way with this conceptualisation of agency means recognising the obligations that the developed world has to facilitate those types of necessary changes for the developing world and in turn both minimise the harm of transitioning and also minimising the harm of climate change itself. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll take a question from us. Uh, there are two questions from students. Uh, if you want me to uh, take them together, I can do that or one by one. What do you prefer? Um, I'm happy to uh, take them one by one. OK, fine. Yeah. Uh, so Shishiraj, who is a second year student, and he's also taken the course on geopolitics, security and environmental change. So. Uh, yeah, Shishiraj. Uh, hi, sir. It was a great, great lecture, and like it was, like it, it it was really important for me as a student to get into the discourse and where it will lead to in future. But one of the central, like one of the thoughts that has already been in my mind that we have been talking about these things lately very much. Like there is some sort of global consensus, and people across the globe, even the student community and academy and academics are like more into the debate. But what is the real factor that is impeding the collective action from political class? Like why states are not taking collective action? Even if, as you mentioned, that seventy percent of climate climate change has been. 
security network security document and there are already n number of solutions even in the geoengineering or other major service level but what are are the factors that is impeding in a collective decision making or collective action why political class is not taking and the issue as seriously as, as you to be taken as thanks very much for that sister raj I, I i confess you were cutting out a little bit but i think the the thrust of your um question around this this issue of um we seem still a long way away from even genuine global consensus and con collective action momentum on addressing the problem of climate change itself and that even at the level of trying to um, sort of coordinate responses to minimizing greenhouse gas emissions and i think that's absolutely true it's one of the reasons actually that i say more conservative approaches to security that say let's preserve the status quo are almost damned by the failure of the international system to effectively address the problem we've seen continually rising emissions and already some of the implications of climate change uh, throughout the world felt in what well, felt in felt in Australia with bushfires felt in India in a range of different ways from heat waves to floods and this is one of the big challenges we face I think there's possibility to be optimistic about the, about the sense of international momentum around climate action that we're beginning to see far too late it should have come it should have come earlier but it is getting harder and harder for countries to um, pretend that climate change isn't happening um, even Donald Trump recognized the science of climate change um, it's getting harder and harder for countries to try to keep going with traditional modes of fossil fuel development and export my own country Australia is under so much international pressure just now because of its ongoing commitment to um, coal exporting um, and its minimal climate reduction ambitions. So in that sense, I think, especially in the lead up to um, Glasgow in November, the next conference of the parties, we'll hopefully see growing momentum around this um, particular issue. There is, I think, also some possibility that the COVID context might provide an opportunity for countries to make different choices in terms of the structure of not just energy systems, but economies and how they actually function. So I take your point that we are seeing a massive and arguably unprecedented failure of collective action that climate change represents. But um, in part because we don't have any other choice than to work together, I think there has to be some sort of degree of of hope or optimism around creating pathways to ensure that that does happen in the future. There are glimmers of hope, I think. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Shishura. Yes, Teresa. She's also a second year student who has taken the uh, course on geopolitics, security and environmental change. Yeah, Teresa. Hi, Sunar. This is Teresa and um, am I audible? Yeah, you are. All right. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about intersectionality within climate change and I've been reading quite a bit about it and it, you can just give me a general outlook of what's your perspective on it. Basically, I wanted to know if it is practical to include the aspect of intersectionality within climate change, because I've seen it on paper, but when it comes to practical measures, I'm seeing I'm not seeing much of that. Uh, so do you think in the future, maybe there would be practical approaches to be more inclusive or do you think that's just a hoax as long as um, old white men are in control? <laughs> <laughs> that's a very, very good question. A very fair point, Teresa. Um, I'm incredibly impressed that your um, that your students are learning about intersectionality, which is is fantastic. I think people like Kaiser and, and Cromsell um, have developed some really interesting work around how feminist scholarship um, can employ uh, this notion of intersectionality to make a case for alternative ecological ethics. And I think that's really important. I see that as central to the um, the so-called second, the ways in which second generation ecological um, theorists are, are basically trying to say some of the same struggles 
that we deal with at the level of discrimination and marginalisation between human populations apply to, to questions of, of climate change. And I see that as being incredibly relevant in that context. And I think where what intersectionality gives us and the resources that deploys is that in some ways the, the push that we would make for um, things like recognition of the Anthropocene and the, the impossibility of separating ourselves wholly from the conditions of our own existence in nature. I think intersectionality is already something that we can draw on existing theories of sort of, as noted, existing feminist theories. We can draw on those as ways of making sense of the nature of the eco ecological challenge. So I, I see it as being a really useful tool and I do use it in the um, in the book itself. It gets a, get some mentions. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question from Kiran, who's also a student at the department. Uh, he has posted it in the chat. So he asks uh, how important uh, is simulating urban growth scenarios, especially in the developing countries based on ecological security patterns? And also is urban ecological security a new paradigm? to understand the dilemma to choose between economic development and environmental security. Mm, wow. Um, so one of the one of the challenges, one of the things that um, in a range of countries, there has been this really powerful discourse around the, the distinction between, on the one hand, environmental action, on the other hand, economic growth. And one of the things with pushing in the direction of ecological security in response to climate change is that that absolutely has to change. We can't abandon one in favour of the other. We need to find ways to ensure continued um, economic development, economic opportunity, while at the same time respecting uh, the impacts on the environment. So in that sense, I think ecological security poses a fundamental challenge to that distinction and recognises the imperative of addressing immediate economic need through alternative modes of development, through thinking of development in, in wholly different ways from a model that's based on extraction and continued growth. In terms of in terms of urban growth, that that gets really tricky in terms of the the specificity that we're talking about there in terms of, you know, what what would it mean to approach it? What would it mean to think about how cities develop and grow? and how we build them, how we structure them, what, how would we approach that if approaching it through the lens of ecological security? It means lots and lots of reflection on some of the choices that are being made in terms of what um, cities are going to look like in decades time in the context of a climate change world, how we um, give people some form of connection to nature while at the same time not just sprawl in terms of um, dominating more and more uh, natural space through creating conditions for um, sort of larger dwellings and that all that stuff needs to then be sort of fed into if we my argument with the sensibility is that if we have this framework for thinking about what um, security means in this context, then it's more likely to encourage us to engage in reflection and dialogue around um, the specifics of things like what do cities look like? How do we think about transportation in the future? How do we think about the role of geoengineering? How do we think about energy production? It doesn't necessarily, the book doesn't necessarily have answers specifically to each of those policy areas, rather it develops this framework through which we view these things if we're planning to have progressive responses to them. Um, I don't see any hands raised. I, I have a question, actually one more question since you mentioned about uh, OK, I, I see that a student has raised. Maybe I'll just reserve my question for later. Yes, Madhuanti. Uh, she's also a student at the department, second year student. Yeah, Madhuanti. Thank you for uh, you are not audible. Uh, can you speak up? Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah you are slightly louder so that we can hear you well. Uh, okay, ma'am. Okay, I have two questions, sir. 
Uh, two are also respect to China. So the first question is where does China stand in terms of developing and developed nation? Because it's one of the richest developing country, but it's one of the leading uh, countries in terms of renewable energy technology. So first question is regarding that. And the second question is the current tensions between the great uh, powers like US and China, how this will affect the discourse in terms of ecological security and the climate change. Mm. Two, two very good questions. Thank you, um, Madhu. The um, question of um, China's role is really, it, it is really about um, level of capacity. So someone like uh, Robin Eckersley would make the case that actually we're increasingly dealing with a not a G8 or G7, but a G2 when it comes to climate change, that the most important actors are really the United States and China. And um, they are incredibly significant in terms of their um, ecological footprint, if you like, in terms of their contribution to the problem of climate change, but also their capacity to lead and influence the way other states view this type of issue. So um, they both need to be engaged, obviously, in responding to the, to the challenge. And in this context, there is some concern that if we see an increase in tensions between the United States and China, that we might see attempts from, um, say, one of those countries like China to um, pull back on something like climate change as almost a retaliatory um, measure for, say, something that the Biden administration looks to looks to pursue. So that's a genuine that's a genuine concern. How do you get big countries to recognise their obligations to stay engaged with the international climate regime? And there are dangers then in, inherent in the possibility of conflict that or contestation that's between those states that spills over into inaction on the collective problem of climate change. Um, in some ways, where China fits as a sort of developed or developing country, for me, is is less central than essentially its capacity. So if China is in a position to um, transition rapidly away and to self-fund that transition rapidly away from um, fossil fuels, then it has an obligation to do so. Um, but to the extent that it's still reliant on, um, that it still has a large proportion of its population who are impoverished, that it still hasn't got the same quality of living that um, we would enjoy in, in Europe or North America or indeed Australia, then there should be some expectations that the bar for China to self-fund those types of transitions is is less high than it would be for other for other countries. So, in that sense, China does have obligations. But again, if we think about it in terms of capacity, we have to think: yes, what, how would we characterise its obligations relative to others? And to be fair, the the notion of common but differentiated responsibility really does try to get at that problem. It is, you know, when we think about the climate change regime, and it really has been sort of key axes of debates are on those ethical questions of, you know, who should act and what different responsibilities states uh, have. But it's a really good question. Yeah. OK, so maybe um, if you don't mind, if I if I can ask one last question, uh, I know we are past 11 here, like yeah, an hour. Uh, so this question, actually, this came up even, you know, yesterday during the Earth System Governance Conference that I was, you know, that I attended. And one of the papers was on securitization of climate change in Nigeria, and and the and the the author who presented it, uh, uh, she you know you know she was basically looking at this schism between how climate change is securitized at the governmental level and how the local populations do not really consider the the security implications of climate change or they do not. I mean, you know, it's it's at the end of the day, like the question that you asked, whose security are we talking about and what are the threats essentially that we are talking about? So her research was actually looking a lot at the stories coming out of these communities living on the ground. And there was complete sort of wedge between how the government is talking about climate change, talking about, you know, the national security probably or or you know, it's probably not enough uh, defined as such, and the local populations, which are outside of the realm of the uh, the security discourses, uh, you know, uh, by their own choice, or maybe because of the design of the policy choices made by the government itself. So you know, so is there a need for security researchers to actually go to the ground more and more to get more empirical uh, about how really these security discourses play out? 
uh, in various contexts. So what do you have to say about that, especially when it comes to this ecological security discourse? Oh, abs absolutely. That is a fascinating example. And there's a piece with Simon, that Simon Dolby um, co-authored with, with someone that ran a very similar line to that in terms of that gap between how securitization plays out at the elite versus the on the ground level. So I mentioned Pierre Bourdieu, who would be appalled at the idea that you wouldn't be conducting that level of ethnographic research where you're going and engaging with local populations and thinking about how they understand the context in which they're operating. And I think that's probably a good um, reminder for me to, to make clear that these are necessarily um, that the discourses, these, the sort of claims about how um, these broad discourses encourage sets of practices are our tendencies rather than necessarily exactly how things play out in practice we can see limitations if we if we view these things just through the lens of national security we can see limitations in terms of the recognition of obligations to others but that doesn't necessarily mean that some national security discourses aren't better than other national security discourses and that's an important point to make that yes we can talk in broad terms about how these discourses function and the choices that they they make but both the nature of them in comparative terms and the way they play out on the ground are potentially going to be really different so I think you're right. I think we do need to to start to drill down in terms of how different um, communities understand it. Part of this new project that I'm working on that you, you mentioned in the introduction is understanding how different states approach the national security implications of climate change, but it's trying also to sort of get at how do different agencies within states view this and what are some of the points of agreement, disagreement that we see uh, that we see between them. Okay, so there's, uh, there's one more uh, question here. Dr. Nand Kishore has also raised his hand. Uh, yeah, over to you. Can I? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, that was a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Um, what I, I thought of problematizing is I think when it comes to securitization, I think uh, state across the spectrum in different parts of the world, state continues to think somehow uh, from time immemorial, uh, security has been an elite subject. That means it's decision of a few. Maybe that states are going through uh, two sort of dilemmas. One, uh, because this is one space where they would want to engage with other nations. There is some sort of a competition that who does better or um, are they looking at the other way that let somebody else lead from the front and then we shall do. That's one part of it. Second part of it also at the domestic audience, I think the state is still so conservative that it doesn't want to give up the idea on security to the public or to its citizens. It still wants to be at that pivotal position and wants, wants, it, uh, wants the audience or wants the stakeholders or the citizens to look up to the state as the security provider, whether it is ecological, whether it is the national security that's spoken from the perspective of military. I think the still, uh, still the state is very, very conservative and it holds it very close to its heart. I think there where uh, when we talk about uh, intersectionality of having different stakeholders, taking it to the lowest level of who are the affected? Will they be able to contribute or to listen to them in all these spaces? I think because of a certain attachment to the word security being very state centric, I think there is some problem that uh, especially at least I can reflect from uh, India's state of affairs. I think it still makes uh, what you say or it still expects people to look up to the state to deliver a lot of things. And uh, invariably over a period of time, the way people have got trained, people also look up to the state to uh, what is a be the net security provider, whether it is an issue of simple public distribution system to environmental change to border security. I think in all the spaces, they are still expecting state to be the security provider. I think this is into uh, the classical way of how uh, people like Agamben, uh, George Agamben put up saying that state creates a space where you look up to the state to uh, where, what is a deliver 
the things that you anticipate. It it does not. It will keep quiet for a while, and then state uh, state just becomes a spectator on some of these issues, which are very tricky, which are also international in nature, and then pushes people themselves to go walk up to the state and then demand, why don't you do something, so that they can take credit to it, saying that one we have responded to a requirement that has come from the society. I think this dilemma. Uh, can be broken only when I think it becomes a societal movement. It's not just a section of scholars in the country who speak about it or a section of activists who speak about it. I think there's also this divide between the activists and then the academics. Academics. I think the academic activists has to come together so that they can go further to the lowest level to educate people and then subsequently make it make it to look uh, for the state that it's a very normal sort of a necessity is not something that phenomenally the state has to deliver. I think that's the that's the better approach I find uh, when it comes to ecological security uh, if it has to be taken forward. I think probably your comments on that would be very helpful. That's the idea of intellectuals who see their role in that way. It reminds me of um, uh, Gramsci's notion of organic intellectuals true, true, true. who try to work true. within um, and try to reach out to to change from within. I think you're right. I think um, on the question of the state, the, the challenge isn't necessarily that we lecture to the state and then the state says, OK, we've realised we need to make this type of change. The, the state has to be compelled. So we have to find ways to get the state and the, those who are occupy positions of power within the state to understand their role in that way. And you're right that that requires significant levels of pressure from within. Now, even if some of that pressure is less about, um, you know, here's why ecological security is the way to approach this, even if it's about things like, you know, how do we manage to, to um, push for more action and more ambition on climate change? There are all sorts of things I think that individuals can do and are doing to change the state and the way the state views those types of issues. So I still see a crucial role for the state, but it's going to have to be pushed and prodded all the way by a concerned citizenry who also want to see um, those types of changes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much for all these responses. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, so I think it's a good time to also uh, close the event. Uh, we've had a wonderful discussion um, and I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that the students will be inspired to, like I mentioned in my email to you, they will be inspired to take up this book and read more uh, about uh, about ecological security and generally on discourses of security, which is, like I mentioned, very important to understand in today's context where we are seeing so many different challenges uh, from different uh, angles. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Matt, for uh, uh, for agreeing, uh, for actually accepting our invitation, first of all, and uh, giving us this wonderful opportunity to listen to you and uh, discuss with you and hopefully carry forward these discussions uh, as we move ahead. And because I know you're not going to stop at this, you're going to further explore <laughs> further areas of research. And I'm sure, you know, there's a lot that students and, you know, I can take from all these uh, all these works that you will produce in the future. So uh, just to formally thank you once again uh, for taking your time out. Uh, and like like Dr. Nankishore also mentioned, we will invite you again and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully we will get to listen to you more in the future as well. And, you know, at some point of time, I would hopefully like to meet you in person. So that's that's also <laughs> that's yes. also in the offering. Yeah. OK, so thank you so much. I would like to also formally thank the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, particularly Dr. Nankishore for uh, for making this event possible because uh, because as I mentioned, you know, uh, these uh, environmental security is still a peripheral issue in India. I think we have had this conversation. Uh, I mean, you know, Matt and I have have had this conversation before. Also, it's not really a mainstream issue in India, and this is something that we need to push. And our department, in particular, under the leadership of Dr. Nankisho, we are trying to push that agenda forward and trying to see how we can include more issues under the security umbrella to, I mean, like you said, you prod the state, you know, keep on prodding the state. And this is possibly one ways of doing it, especially by creating a generation of students who can 
you know, actually do that. And as you as you saw, there are quite a few students who are interested in these areas and would like to pursue their interest uh, in these areas. So thank you to the department. Thank you to all my colleagues uh, who um, who are present in, in this particular uh, in this webinar and also contributed to the coordination of this event. And and most importantly, I would like to thank the students for uh, for uh, for participating very actively and asking these very pertinent questions to to Matt. And I'm, I'm sure uh, I hope he he also enjoyed the discussion as much as I did at least and uh, hope to hope to have you again at the at the department and uh, virtually or physically you know whenever whenever the situation is better. Yeah, thank you so much. So thank you Dhanshree and thank you Matt. Um, enjoyed the session very much. Take care. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.